this is my dream, this is my passion, this is something that I believe in. If you're always afraid that things are going to go wrong, your business is not going to succeed. Who would have thought Sots would make us millionaires? I'm a Dirt Hill entrepreneur and CEO of Spurgo. I'm the inventor of the locker board. I'm 14 years old. I'm the CEO of Sally Candy. Now I'm the co-founder here at Rumble Boxing. The CEO of Play Versus. This is my hustle. 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 Today on My Hustle, we're going to see some extraordinary entrepreneurs who have turned their passions into profit. Follow along as we learn about their business, determination, and road to success in the creative industry. We're kicking off today's episode in Philadelphia, where 13-year-old Trey Brown started his own clothing line, Spurgo. I gotta start this deal for productivity, let's go. I'm powerful, I'm strong, I'm courageous, I'm a billionaire, and I won't stop, let's go. A 13-year-old boy from Delaware County is proving age is no limit when it comes to making dreams come true. Spurgo gonna be that household name, that brand that you rock whenever you want to be powerful, whenever you're ready to have a great day. The young entrepreneur created a brand that is now being featured on a billboard in Times Square. Do you think billions of dollars one day? Yes. Spurgo, I want Spurgo to be a household name. Spurgo is gonna be everywhere. He is building a fashion empire. What's going on there, everybody? My name is Trey Brown, and I'm a Thirst Hill entrepreneur and CEO of Spurgo, and this is my hustle. Spurgo is a unisex designer, clothing brand based in Philadelphia, owned and operated by me. I'm shipping out packages on a daily, nationally, and internationally. Virgo, it's a movement. Here, right here, this is the Leo sweatsuit. This is our ultimate bestseller. A lot of different celebrities were seen wearing this sweatsuit. The baby, Little Dirt, a few basketball players were seen wearing Spurgo. My little brother right here. Yeah, sure. hanging out at Made in America. Some of my proudest moments was definitely being able to retire my mom. It was his goal for me to be home, to be able to help him and be more present, you know, with him and his siblings. We manage every order, you know, with this clipboard. It's about, I would say about 20 pages now, just four different orders, making sure all orders get shipped. Right now I'm packing up a few orders. This is going to Missouri, Louisiana, Philadelphia, PA the hometown, Delaware, Atlanta, Georgia, Virginia, Texas, Maryland, New York, New Georgia. Right now we have Share Talent, Barbershop and Salon. This is where um, the beginning of Spurgo, the first business, the first barbershop I ever came into. I came in here like with a bag full of shirts and I asked Mr. Omar, could I sell you know, some Spurgo in here? He said yes. I was a little nervous. My name is Trey Brown and I'm 12 years old. I started my own clothing line and everything. Everybody, you know, supported Spurgo and supported what I had going on. It became a family after this, always coming in, um, just stopping by, constant support every time I come in to share a talent. Welcome back, man. Welcome back to the hood. We see you doing big things in the world. Yeah. Started off here. Yeah, you don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> Coming from Philadelphia, there is a lot of violence and there is a lot of crime. But my thing is, I, I want to show to you that it's a different way. Many people in our community is hopeless and it's kind of like you kind of take what you get. But he's choosing not to take what statistics say and you know what is assumed his future should be. Ooh, I got a shipment coming in today. A lot of times that's what a lot of the kids grew up in. They grew up in seeing, you know, negative things, but I'm showing kids that it's another way, that you don't have to go that way. You could be positive, you could be powerful, you can own your own business, you could get on jets, you could travel. It's bigger than you know it's bigger than the streets of Philadelphia and I'm showing them that as long as you work hard, you're determined, you're passionate about what you want to do, you could achieve anything. Outside of working with Spurgo, I love to hang out with my friends. You know, I'm still a normal kid, but I got a business. I think that the Spurgo product is very representative to the like the city and you know like the kids, the people. She's a young black entrepreneur doing his thing. It's like nobody really else in the city of Philadelphia really doing what he's doing right now. It's been great watching him do his thing and 
build this empire that he's building. He has been inspiring me to push harder and do what I want, like what I want to do in life. Sometimes I'm spending a lot more time on the business, you know, than playing. But that's what it's all about. Um, I'm committing now. I get to play later. But right now, um, I'm focusing on Spurgo and making it a billion-dollar company. So sometimes I might not be able to always be able to play. But I'm building an empire right now, and that's what I'm focused on. That's my main goal, and that's I'm gonna achieve it. Hustle in general means to me like getting up every single morning, you know, to reach a goal. Um, I get up every single morning, you know, to build Spurgo. I get up every single morning because this is my dream. This is my passion. This is something that I believe in. I believe in Spurgo, so I get up and hustle. That's what my hustle means to me. When we come back, we'll see how a Haitian DJ is bringing his island music to the world. Michael Bruin's love for music has allowed him to work with musicians like Calvin Harris, Steve Aoki, and Jay Balvin, and to share his Haitian culture through music. I would have never imagined that so much came from this. You recently collaborated with Michael Bruin. Michael Bruin. And then I was so happy to see you guys collaborate with the song that's going to be used for World Cup. Yeah. Yeah. Haiti's always been, you know, the perception is always, always been bad. He wants to change, you know, the Haiti perception too. Like I want to change my Colombian and Latin perception in the world. get to connect with people and to see the effects that music or an experience like a show because I know that I'm doing this not just for myself or for my family but I'm like literally trying to lift up my entire country. This is Michael Bren. I'm a music producer and DJ from Puerto Prince Haiti and this is my hustle. Right now I'm working on a bunch of new projects back in the studio after finishing my bio tour. This is the biggest tour that I've done in my entire life. Played 10 cities in the US and now going to Europe at the end of the year. So I'm just getting like a bunch of good new music ready for that. Whenever I come back in New York, I feel like I just have to put all my ideas on. In the beginning, it was just so much work when I started doing music because I was living and breathing it in a way where every single thing I did was new. Figuring out all these different aspects of my career pretty much worked until I fell asleep and then woke up and did it again the next day for years. Eventually, I got signed by two different really big artists at the time, Hardwell and Dirty South on their labels and that was like the beginning of a whole bunch of other stuff. So I ended up working with like Calvin Harris and Siesto and Steve Angelo and a lot more people. It was incredible. I got to play festivals, I played Ultra Music Festival, I played Coachella, I played EDC, I played around the world. And I learned a lot about being an artist throughout that like period between I guess like 16 to early 20s. But then as I like grew up as an artist, I realized that I loved Haitian music and Haitian culture as well. So I felt like incorporating Haitian culture, Haitian sounds with what I had learned making electronic music was a really great way to do that. And I didn't want to just like throw something together. So I took my time and like did research and looked at what other artists had done from Haiti and internationally. When I felt that I understood it well enough, that's when I started putting the two together and transitioned into what I'm doing now. It's going to be playing tonight at a very special show called Tsipatsi. Uh, it's a fundraiser for the Cruji Carnaval, which is an organization that Arcade Fire and a bunch of other amazing artists work with. And we're now at the Preservation Hall uh, in the French Quarter, looking at some amazing Haitian art all around. Uh, this is the Beauté Blie exhibit. So uh, getting some inspiration, some good vibes, and then going to play tonight. Can't wait. Working on Local, my debut album, was the first like focused Haitian music project that I had done so far. And that to me was like years of work. That was collaborating with a lot of different artists from Haiti across the board, so many different genres, and then merging that with different artists that I worked with internationally. So Major Lazer, Mr. Easy, Adekun and Gold, who are both from Nigeria, Guilty Beats producer from Ghana, Wen and Regine from Arcade Fire, putting all of that together with classics and creating something that nobody's heard before. I tried as much as possible from the music videos to the artwork to the music to every single aspect of this for it to be made in Haiti. If you've never heard anything about Haiti or you've never seen anything about Haiti, that project can serve as like a, a guide into the culture. 
Another huge moment that happened pretty recently was I did the World Cup song with J Balvin. That was a dream of mine that I didn't even think would ever be possible. Like getting to do that and then going on tour with him, playing across the US and like all these stadiums and then doing my own personal tour as well. I feel like those kind of big festival moments or those big song moments, those are all a combination of many years of work. There are a lot of challenges, I think, when you're working as an artist independently. Creating opportunities for touring, for example. It's bio is a completely different concept from anything that most venues would normally book. So I had to work on that from the ground up and be like, hey, this is what the show is about. This is what the sound of the show is. This is what it looks like. And then convince these venues to like, hey, you know, book us. It's gonna do well. It took me doing a lot of shows that didn't do well to get to the point where it's like, oh, this is what people would enjoy seeing. But when you go from like a 40-person show to like 25 people over two or three years you see the work that it takes to do that and it takes a lot of mistakes and it takes a lot of things not going well for you to realize I need to adjust until I get to the point where it's working correctly and taking risks is, is part of this like you really you have to have faith in yourself and not be afraid to fail because as soon as you're not afraid to fail and you have the mindset that you're gonna figure out what success comes from you'll find it. One of my favorite quotes is, if opportunity doesn't knock, build a door. In the example of like getting to work with Jay Balvin, I had nobody in common with Jay Balvin before we met, but just having the thought that it was possible and then figuring out like, how do we make that work? And it happening is like it, building a door. Above even making music is I want to be known as an artist that built bridges from Haiti to the rest of the world, but also across all these different cultures and sounds that, that I've worked with as well. I found that the more I'm working with people around the world, the more I've realized like, how similar people are, not how different they are. It's hopeful and I think it's needed. The music can be a source of, of strength and healing. And it's helped a lot that people actually are open to new things. They want to hear new things and see new things. After the break, we'll talk to an LA-based barber who cuts the hair of A-list celebrities and athletes. I didn't think a pair of clippers would take me this far around the world. And started off as a hobby and then now it's, it's my life. He just gets it, the blends, the fades, like nobody does it like him. He cut me once and I was like, yep, nobody's cut me ever again. Again, I came out here to create something out of myself and create my own lane and I feel like I did just that, you know. Just a young kid from Toronto trying to make a name and trying to make a career for myself. What's up guys, my name is Vince Garcia. I'm the barber and co-owner of Gray Matter, and this is my hustle. What's going on guys, it's your boy Vince the Barber, I'm one of the co-owners here at Gray Matter. I'm gonna give you guys a little tour, check it out. We do everything as basic as a simple cut, men's haircut. Uh, we do beard trims, beard shaves. Um, what I tell a lot of people is, you know, we don't sell haircuts, we sell the experience. So let me guys show you one of our experiences that we do is a hot towel. We have this tub in the back and it's, um, it's pretty much soaked in essential oils that we actually have our own scent for. It, um, it soothes the skin, opens up the pores, and just makes you feel nice and fresh. All right, let me take it to my chair. So this here is my station, this is where all the magic happens. You know, I've been able to cut some of my A-list clients here. Um, some at NBA athletes such as Kyle Kuzma, Damian Lillard, CJ McCollum, some actors as far as Ludacris, musicians, Fat Joe, Fabulous, uh, and many more. The reason why I picked LA was because a part of me wanted to get into you know, cutting on set, cutting actors, celebrities, and LA is the perfect place for that. So the shop is pretty much a group of people that come together, voice their own opinions, and there's, there's certain topics that just get thrown out there, you know, and my role there is just pretty much one of the main barbers that takes care of people on, on the set, so we've had some big names on the show already, we, like Nas was on the show, we had Pharrell on the show, uh, Mary J. Blige, like it's just a lot of dope people that like I looked up to growing up and being able to be in the same space as them and like hearing what they say about certain things, it's, it's pretty cool and inspiring. Like seeing my work on TV, and it's cool. You know, like I didn't expect to be able to do all this as a barber, and it's, it's a cool feeling. 
for me, you know, coming from Toronto, I used to draw a lot, so I actually started off doing lineups and designs on all my friends. I didn't know how to fade. Uh, but my childhood barber at the time, he used to call me every week, so when I realized that I wanted to become a barber, every time I would get cut, I would tell him to teach me the basics. From there, it just kind of took off. Started off as a hobby, and then now it's, it's my life. <laughs> When I told a lot of my friends and family that I was gonna move to LA, drop everything and start from the bottom, they are like, you can't do it. You know, it's like, you gotta just use that as fuel to keep going. But coming out here, I had to step out of my comfort zone and pretty much sell myself, sell my work. A term I use a lot is like, closed nose don't get fed. So if I'm not out there expressing what I do and selling my, my craft, then who's gonna wanna trust me cutting their hair? And so I had to go everywhere I went, whether it was the clubs or restaurants, gas stations, grocery stores, I would hand out my business card and pretty much sell myself. Tell them, you know, I know you probably got a barber, but you know, I own a barber shop, why don't you try me out? Um, first cut, I'll give you a discount, something, just to get them in the chair. And I just know, you know, I'm confident in myself that once I cut them that one time, they'll keep coming back. And, you know, I just kept using that whole motto and it, it worked, I was able to build a pretty, quick clientele base in a matter of months, so it worked out. Outside of the shop, um, what I love doing most is playing basketball. You know, I've been playing ball ever since I was a kid, so it's just something where I could just be free and free my mind and not worry about clients calling me, trying to get in the chair. Yeah, just my, you know, a way to come together with my homies and just uh, play a good game of basketball. One of the mottos that I live by is a uh, grind, hustle, stack. You know, now, you know, I'm, I'm almost 33. Like I said, I got two kids, I got a family. It's a matter of just like hustling, working hard, stacking your money. Yeah, those are just three, three main words that I kind of live by. And the grind of it all is just, you know, keep practicing, keep doing it every day, practice, practice after school. And I feel like barbering, that's what, that's what we're known for. You know, hustling, cutting hair, and um, the grind is, is, is our lifestyle. When we come back, Sophia Chang shows us how her graphic design work has led her to opportunities with Nike, the NBA, and other major organizations. Here in LA, Sophia Chang has turned her interest in illustration and design into an opportunity. I think, you know, whenever you get asked that question, what do you want to be when you grow up, I've always wanted to be an artist. I didn't know how or what, but I knew that it was something that I wanted to do. Sophia Chang, I'm an illustrator and designer, and this is my hustle. Welcome to my workspace here in LA. A lot of fun illustration stuff. Beginning of this year, Adidas was getting ready for the Copa Cup and they had done this special shoe with them. And so I had a chance to work on this really large mural that lived on the window display for their Fifth Avenue store, which is amazing, especially coming from New York, you know, just to have my work on Fifth Avenue. It's kind of a huge honor. So Donovan Mitchell was with NBPA and they wanted to highlight Donovan Mitchell as not literally Rookie of the Year. Um, I guess they, they call it Leader of the New School and so this was a really fun illustration to be able to highlight that. And then with the MLS, one prominent one is um, Scarf Timber for the month of September. They're essentially like scarves for that people could purchase that was really all about um, raising awareness and raising money, funds for uh, childhood cancer. So we can kind of go over here where I can show you a little bit more about my work. Um, I try to keep all of my sketches. Some of the sketches for this guy is actually on here. And this is like this workout studio in LA that I like going to, and I really didn't like their decor and wallpaper. So I actually had reached out to them, and a lot of my opportunities are like this, where like I just asked them, hey, my name's Sophia, I'm an illustrator, can I make some stuff for you? You know, aside from client projects, I'm always looking at different ways that I can tie in personal things that I enjoy and, and turn opportunities, I turn those in interests into opportunities. And another 
prominent project that I worked on was a collection with Puma in 2013. So this was supposedly their top lifestyle grossing collection up until Rihanna had done hers. The intention for this project when I worked on it was really to create something for everyone. So I created kind of a different colorway for each kind of consumer. Future wore it, Jay-Z wore it, Rihanna. It totally came as a surprise. I didn't know the collection was gonna do so well. And the collection also got me in a number of books. So there's a sneakers book and they kind of cover everything street culture related and sneaker culture and so here I am. I have been drawing pretty much my whole life. I never even knew what the word illustration was until I got into college and I actually pursued a major in illustration. And then after I graduated school, it was just like any other person's story, starving artists, you name it. Uh, counting change to try to take the train and buy a metro card to go see a potential client and doing calls like that. One of my larger breaks was definitely working on the illustration for Anthony Bourdain. I had a friend who knew somebody who knew somebody that had worked with the production company for Travel Channel and they were looking for an illustrator and so they had recommended me. The production company put it on Facebook. It was so well received that I got a direct call from Travel Channel to hire me for the entire project so that was amazing and of course there was a lot of great press around that project itself which then helped to bring a little bit of awareness for me. I think the biggest takeaway from that is also the fact that I did this completely free. I did it just simply because I thought it was a great opportunity, so I was willing to invest my time and my energy into the project. Yeah, and I'm really grateful to be able to have worked with um, a lot of the brands that I have now, but a lot of it really is a lot of work. And I know for sure that 10 years ago, I definitely couldn't have dreamt to have been able to work with all these great clients. We are here in Long Beach, California at the Art of Bloom exhibit. And so Undo, my health and wellness platform, is gonna be hosting a special event tonight, which is a yoga practice in collaboration with Jiva Mukti Yoga. Undo Ordinary is a health and wellness platform that I started with my business partner. It really came from just our natural interest in the sciences and health and wellness and learning about all these things and having come from more of a streetwear kind of culture, we realized that a lot of this messaging doesn't exist for us. And Undo has been this platform for us to be able to share that information. And it's led to a lot of great opportunities to work with different brands. We're hosting a yoga event at a art exhibition called Art of Bloom. And so they had reached out to Undo to see, hey, what's a cool way we can work together? One of my favorite yoga studios in New York just opened up in LA. And so I was thinking, hey, why not tie everyone together and have them host a yoga class underneath this beautiful exhibition and we'll tie in all of our communities and bring everyone together. I'd say one of my favorite quotes was from one of my global studies teachers and he said whatever it is you're gonna be treat it like you want to be the best at it. So if you're gonna be a doctor or janitor or a librarian treat your work like you want to be the best librarian there is. My hustle means a lot to me. I mean, the word hustle on its own really speaks to my upbringing, uh, being a native New Yorker. I try not to take things as just face value. I'm always thinking of ways that I can turn it into something bigger and grander. Whatever your creative outlet is, if you work hard at it, you can turn it into a career. With a crazy idea, dedication, and drive, you can do anything. These four entrepreneurs have shown us what their hustle is. What's yours? <laughs>